Thank you all for joining us again for another Bible study. And uh, as usual, we will start our study with a word of prayer and then uh, with uh, 30 minutes of uh, teaching and then uh, the forum would be open for questions and uh, comments. Okay. And uh, thank you so much for taking time to join us. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to you for this time, Lord. Thank you very much for helping us to uh, gather once again through this medium to learn more about you and more about your word, Lord. Uh, especially, Lord, this moment we ask you for your leading and guidance throughout our study. We want to hear your voice through your servant, O oh Lord. So open our hearts and minds and speak to us. With the, with, speak to us with the word that we require today, O oh God. Strengthen us in our faith and help us so that we may experience you more closely. Everything that we study, it may help us in becoming strong uh, in relationship with you, O Lord, and we may be able to reflect the same uh, with the, towards the people around us. Through everything we do, your name be exalted. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Uh, having said that, I would like to give this time to Pastor Dan, to take it over uh, for the teaching session. Thank you, uh, Praveen, and good evening again to all of you. Uh, even as we begin our study today, uh, just wanted to update you on Sam, uh, Samuel Poppins, who is the brother of uh, Sir Franklin Poppins. Uh, he was hospitalized uh, last night apparently with uh, severe uh, abdominal pains. And it looks like uh, it's, there is some kind of a uh, constipation type thing which uh, needs some treatment. Uh, he's feeling better today, but uh, Franklin uh, updated me this evening saying that uh, he still has to remain in hospital because uh, he is, needs to be put on saline uh, because there is no intake. Uh, so hopefully he should be okay, and uh, he is very eager to get out of the hospital. Unfortunately, we can't visit him because of all this uh, uh, protocols regarding COVID, uh, hoping that we can do an online prayer for him. Okay, having said that, thank you again for joining, and today we are will continue with uh, our booklet, We Believe, basically a document that uh, sort of uh, elaborates on our uh, doctrinal position on various uh, doctrinal, you know, uh, statements of the Bible, our beliefs of the Bible. And we are moving to section eight today. And the section is titled The Sacraments. All right. So Let's go ahead and start reading the questions and answers. As usual, I will make some comments in between and feel free to uh, write down your questions and we can have a discussion after. So we'll go to 8.1. Uh, Praveen, are you going to put that thing on? Yes. Uh, you will see the question and answer on your screen. Let's read question 8.1. The question reads, what is a sacrament? Uh, and the answer is, it is a special act of Christian worship instituted by Christ, which uses a visible sign to proclaim and receive the promise of the gospel for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. A sacrament is received in faith, trusting in God to minister to us by the Holy Spirit through it. By God's grace, the sacrament seals God's promise to uh, believers and is a special means to convey to us what is promised by the sign. In baptism, the sign is that of water. In the Lord's Supper, the sign is that of bread and wine. Okay, so let's uh, just discuss a little bit on what is a sacrament. And after that, I just wanted to digress from the book to the booklet to some thoughts on the sacraments and how people or how various other uh, you know denominations believe in and practice the sacraments now what is the what is a sacrament 
notice uh, it says a special act of christian worship so we believe that whenever we participate in a sacrament of the church it is a uh, basically uh, an act of worship right uh, and we believe that these two that is mentioned in the answer that is baptism and uh, the communion bread and wine is instituted by christ now why did he do that he did it as a visible sign it is a uh, 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 something you know to uh, to uh, portray that which is invisible by a visible sign uh, and what does it portray to proclaim and receive the promise of the gospel for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life so in other words a sacrament is a visible sign of the invisible grace of god how god you know deals with us and gives us his grace is through or uh, through the visible sign of the sacrament so that is how we would like to understand it so whenever we participate in a sacrament like for example the communion which is probably the one of the more common ones we participate in uh, it is received in faith trusting in god in other words uh, we don't see the grace being dispensed to us but we do it in faith trusting that god is now you know uh, uh, interacting with us through his grace okay so the visible signs like is mentioned are communion and baptism these are the two visible uh or sacraments that we believe in now let me just uh, give you some thoughts on how denominations uh tend to regard these sacraments for example the catholic church that this is the roman catholic church uh they according to their catechism uh they define sacraments as efficacious signs they call it efficacious signs of grace instituted by christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us so it is basically very similar to how we also define sacraments right it is a visible sign for the invisible grace of god dispensed to us now the catholic church recognizes seven sacraments unlike what we discussed we discussed only two let me just give you the second seven sacraments of the catholic church it is baptism eucharist which another word for it is communion and they have confirmation this is when a member of the church or rather a, a person who is baptized as an infant infant is now confirmed as a member of the church uh, or being commissioned to take responsibility for being a member of the church becoming actively involved that is confirmation the fourth one is reconciliation this is once again we are describing the sacraments of the catholic church reconciliation is confession or penance right this is uh, how uh, uh, the, the word reconciliation means confession and most of you will know the catholic church uh, has a very visible uh, what do you call it uh, 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 something that is done very often confession uh, uh, the next one is anointing of the sick marriage the marriage ceremony is a sacrament according to them and the holy orders which means ordinations ordinations to bishops priests deacons so these are the seven sacraments of the catholic church i was looking at the eastern orthodox church the eastern orthodox church also have most of these and they include one more which is called chrismation chrismation is apparently uh immediately done after baptism whether it is infant baptism or uh, baptism of you know uh, maybe someone who is an adult but the priest anoints the various parts of the body of the newly baptized member with holy oil after baptism so chrismation is something that the eastern orthodox 
uh, church recognizes as a sacrament. I think this is very similar to the confirmation under the Roman Catholic Church. Now, when it comes to Protestants, uh, which includes the Anglicans, the Protestant church or the Protestant churches, including the Anglicans, believe in only two sacraments, unlike the seven that the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox uh, practice. What are the two? Baptism and communion. Okay, these are the only two. And the question is, why do the Protestant churches believe in only two sacraments? This, it is simply because these were the only two that Jesus commanded. Jesus did not talk about any of the other sacraments that the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox uh, churches believe. What were the two that were commanded? Well, uh, in Matthew 28, Jesus commands, go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that is why baptism becomes a sacrament for the Protestant church. And the second one, uh, when Jesus uh, institutes the communion, he says, do this in remembrance of me. So these are the two, communion and baptism, that the uh, Protestant churches accept and uh, practice. Interestingly enough, there are a few churches that are non-sacramental churches. Okay, if you can call it that. In other words, these churches do not have any sacrament or do not believe in any sacraments, neither do they have any practice of it. For example, the Salvation Army does not practice any formal sacraments and, they ha and their reason is that, uh, you know, these are something that, uh, let me see, uh, uh, they, they feel that they don't need to practice something that is spiritual, already accomplished. So uh, they do not have any uh, practice of sacraments. The, um, I'm not sure if we have any of the Anabaptist movement, that we have the Baptist mo ba Baptists now, but there was a group called the Anabaptists uh, they also believe that there is no need for any outward expression, uh, you know, through the sacraments of whatever we, whatever we practice. So I thought I'll just keep you, you know, give you some thoughts on how various denominations practice uh, sacraments. I am, uh, I was very interested to, you know, as I was doing this uh, little study, <clears throat> We in the in the worldwide Church of God in the pra, in the you know the the uh, the pre-reformed worldwide Church of God, it almost seemed like we also had sacraments. We believed in the baptism as well as uh, communion, but the way we observed the holy days and the Sabbath day almost seemed like it was a sacrament. Uh, we used to give a tremendous amount of importance to the Sabbath and holy days. Uh, in fact, that the practice of that actually defined whether we were members of the church or not. Uh, so it almost seems like the Sabbath and Holy Days were like a sacrament for the worldwide Church of God. Of course, now we have reformed it to what, you know, just the two, baptism and the communion. Let's go back now to the uh, the booklet. We will pick up the Question now, the second question, 8.2. Uh, just wait for that to come up on the screen. Let's read the question 8.2. Why do we participate in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper? The answer is we baptize because Jesus Christ was baptized for us and commanded us to baptize. We share in his baptism by being baptized in his name. Our baptism bears witness to Jesus' baptism for us and express our faith in his baptism for us. Our partaking of the Lord's Supper bears witness to the communion he has set out for us at his table and expresses our faith that his self-offering has restored our communion with him and with the Father in the Spirit. In the Lord's Supper, we receive from him what he has given us, 
namely himself. We receive from him his body broken for us and his life blood poured out for us through the two sacraments. We bear witness not so much to our faith, but to who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us through his baptism and self-sacrifice. So this question distinguishes between baptism and Lord's Supper. Remember, why do we have only two uh, sacraments in our church, officially speaking? Or we consider them as sacraments, not that we don't have, you know, uh, marriage ceremonies or, uh, you know, uh, some of the other things that is mentioned. But we recognize only these two. So baptism is commanded by Jesus, so we observe, them, observe it as a sacrament. The important thing here to understand with regards to baptism is that we are sharing uh, in the baptism of Jesus. Uh, we are, I think I have mentioned this maybe uh, uh, you know before. Jesus was baptized, you know, not because he had to repent of any sins. We know that he was sinless, but he was baptized for on behalf of us, you know, uh, in our place. He was baptized for humanity. And so when we uh, are baptized, when we practice the sacrament of baptism, we are actually participating in his baptism. All right. Uh, so we are expressing our faith in his baptism for us. Uh, of course, baptism also symbolizes the death and burial and of course the resurrection because we are going into a watery grave and then we are coming out a new person with a you know a new uh, uh, life or we look forward to a new life and so all of these are, are part of the symbolism of baptism now why do we participate in the communion obviously because jesus commanded it how does it uh, uh, or rather what does it picture what does it portray uh, it portrays his self offering uh, and because of his self-offering, it has restored our communion with him and with the Father in the Spirit. So our communion in Jesus brings us into communion with the Holy Spirit and with the Father because we are participating in Christ's humanity. Uh, in, of course, we know the incarnation of Jesus. And then Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body. Uh, drink, this is my blood. We are participating in actually in his humanity and which looks forward to the new humanity or the, uh, the resurrected spiritual bodies we can have even as Jesus does. Okay. Um, one more thought before we move to the third question. Uh, it says through the two sacraments, we bear witness not so much to our faith. Of course, it is a faith that we are showing in these sacraments as we participate. But more, but more importantly, uh, these sacraments bear witness to who Jesus is, right? So the question, the who question always comes up. We have to recognize who is God and who is Jesus. So who is Jesus with regards to baptism or, uh, and the communion? Uh, it is what Jesus did for us, okay? Uh, he was baptized for us. In other words, he is immersing himself into humanity. And he's allowing us to immerse into his divinity, you could say, and sharing in his resurrected humanity, in a glorified humanity. And of course, the communion is accepting his self-sacrifice. So Jesus' self-sacrifice for us is all bearing witness to in these two sacraments. All right. We'll go now to the next one, 8.3, the question in our uh, booklet. 8.3, the question reads, what is the relationship between the word of promise and the sacramental sign? Okay, in other words, why does the sacramental sign become meaningful for us, right? That is what basically what the question is asking. Let's read the answer and we'll make some comments. Take away the word of promise 
and the water of baptism is merely water and the bread and wine of the lord's supper are merely bread and wine okay the elements have no natural power in themselves to convey the blessings of god but consecrated by the spirit and word of promise which is actually the prayer that we do the elements become visible words of god that we receive in action in this way the elements by grace convey to receptive faith what they promise the presence of our lord jesus christ okay the sacraments are thus visible words that uniquely assure and confirm that no matter how greatly we may have sinned christ died for us and comes to live in us and with us by his spirit they are specially appointed means that god has provided for us to receive the transforming healing reconciling grace of god all right so what the how does the sacrament sacramental sign become meaningful for us remember we said that these sacraments the communion and the baptism are visible signs of invisible grace how does it become invisible grace because of the promise of god as we call it the word of promise and as we pray like in baptism or uh, we pray after the person is baptized to receive the holy spirit before we take the elements we pray and ask for god's blessing so we are now taking ordinary water for baptism or ordinary bread and wine and they then uh symbolize uh the grace of god the grace of our lord jesus christ all right so that is why it says the water of baptism is merely water uh these elements have no natural power in themselves right uh to convey the blessings of god but when we take them as symbols or symbolizing something of course symbolizing jesus baptism for us and his uh self sacrifice then they become very meaningful now here comes the big controversy right as you will know uh there are certain denominations that tend to take these things more literally than rather than being more symbolic okay for let me just uh, once again digress just a little bit and come to some uh, practices of or belief systems of some denominations for example you have probably heard of uh, the term transubstantiation which is a very roman catholic belief and what is this belief they believe that the bread and the wine on the table changes its substance to actually become the flesh of jesus and the blood of jesus that is why it is called trans substantiation the the substance of the bread and wine actually changes all right now that is how the roman catholics uh, you know teach their belief with regards to uh, the communion now there is also uh, something called trans substantiation this is a belief and this i think was taught by luther martin luther uh, the reformer uh, and he says that uh, the 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 concept of consubstantiation conveys that christ is actually present in with and under the elements the bread and the wine so he does not go to the extent of saying it changes his substance but christ is present in some mysterious way and that is the doctrine of consubstantiation there are two more belief systems uh, among other uh, denominations one denomination or, or some denominations believe the elements that is the bread and the wine to be a memorial right uh, it is it is a it it is reminds us of something the bread and the wine what does it remind us of obviously it reminds us of the sacrifice so they term the communion as being more memorial rather than the other two that we discussed and of course uh, something very similar to this is the symbolic uh, meaning of the elements 
uh, this, the, the certain denominations believe that the bread and the wine are symbolic of uh, a spiritual presence of Christ. So there is a spiritual presence. Once again, uh, it is uh, in, in a mysterious way. It is uh, Jesus Christ's spiritual presence. Okay. Now, the question is, what do GCI believe? <laughs> and of course, you have read it here, what we believe. We believe the, con uh, um, uh, the elements are consecrated by the spirit and word of promise. The elements become the visible words of God. We believe that there is a presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in the elements. So you could say we are like memorialists as well as symbolists, right? Uh, and to some extent consubstantiationists, because we believe there is that uh, the elements have become or rather bears the presence of Jesus. And that is why after our communion, communion service, we try not to discard uh, the wine and the bread. We try to discard it rather, any excess discarded in a very discreet manner so that it is, uh, we consider it you know, uh, has, uh, uh, you know, a sense of holiness to it. So we are very careful how we discard it. Okay. Now, regarding uh, uh, GCI's perspective, I'd just like to read, I'm not, I'm not sure if Praveen can uh, take it to the, under the teaching notes, it says GCI statement of beliefs, uh, Praveen, if you can just go to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. If we can put that up on the screen, maybe we can read that together. All right. Yeah, there. Yeah, the sacraments of the Lord's Supper. This is the official position of GCI with regards to the, especially the Lord's Supper. Uh, we'll come to baptism a little later. Notice it says, in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we partake of bread and wine in remembrance of our Savior. So it is a memorial. Proclaiming his death until he comes. The Lord's Supper is a participation in the death and resurrection of our Lord. Once again, it is more of a memorial perspective. Just as the bread and wine become part of our physical bodies, so we don't believe in the, what do you call it, in the transubstantiation thing. It is still physical. So we are made by grace to partake spiritually of Jesus Christ in his body and blood. So there is a... Uh, the, uh, sim the, the symbolism part of it there. Thus the Lord's Supper declares to believers that in every aspect of our Christian life, we rely not on any obedience or righteousness of our own, but solely upon the grace of God incarnate in Jesus Christ. So uh, we, do, we do not, uh, you know, believe in this transubstantiation theory, but we may believe to some extent, in the consubstantiation, the memorial and the symbol, symbol uh, perspective of the uh, of the communion. Okay, let me leave it there. If you should have any questions, we can discuss that. Let me then go to uh, uh, eight point four. We will look at eight point four, the question, and then we will uh, stop there and take up questions. We're already 35 minutes into the study. Let's read 8.4 then. Uh, what is the main difference between baptism and the Lord's Supper? The answer says, while baptism is re received only once, the Lord's Supper is received again and again. Being unrepeatable, baptism indicates uh, not only that Christ died for our sins once and for all, but that by grace, we are also united with him once and for all through faith. Being repeatable, the Lord's Supper indicates that we, uh, that as we turn un unfilled to him again and again, our Lord continually fills or rather meets us in the power of the Holy Spirit to fill us, to renew and deepen our faith. So uh, what is the main difference between baptism and the Lord's Supper? Remember. We are believing or, or we consider only these two as sacraments for 
uh, our, our denomination, GCI. Baptism is done once, okay? Uh, because when you believe and are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are united, you know, in a mysterious way, in a spiritual way to Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, we have union with him in the Holy Spirit, right? And this is done once and for all. You don't get disunited, you know, uh, at any other time. Or you don't get disunited if you commit a sin. Uh, you are still united. But of course, we have strayed away from, from uh, God. So we come back to God for repentance. And of course, uh, we have not been disunited. That's the reason why baptism is done only once. If I can just uh, bring your thoughts to the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. The father never stopped considering the son, even though he left the father and went away. He never stopped considering him a son. So similarly, when we turn prodigal, uh, if we fall away uh, in, in, in sinfulness, uh, God does not, you know, disunite himself with us. He is still hoping that we will come back to him in repentance uh, and God continues to consider us with, you know, in, in him. But what about communion? Communion is something we do regularly. And of course, in our fellowship, we do it once a month. There are churches that do it every week. And there are churches that do it every day. There are people who do it on a daily basis. Uh, once again, we have moved away from that controversy. We do not want to say it should be done only once a year. Uh, because that was how the Passover was held. Why do we do it repeatedly? It is because, as it says, we are turning to him for continual sustenance, spiritual sustenance, to give us strength to live our daily life. So we believe and trust that God in the Holy Spirit will continue to provide us and fill us with the strength and the grace and uh, the, the, the strength we need to be able to live our lives and to deepen our faith. Our faith needs to be deepened. And so we believe that uh, a continual participation in the communion, however often that might be, is something we believe as necessary. That's why we have communion on a regular basis, but baptism is done only once, all right? Just a thought, some people, when they change denominations, they believe they must be baptized again. Uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily practice that, we don't teach that. If you believe your baptism was done in a denomination, uh, whether it was infant or whether it was adult, uh, and you believe in it, we accept that as uh, something that is valid, and we don't necessarily, you know, uh, demand a second baptism. But of course, it depends on the person. If the person disbelieves that, then we are willing to give a, a second baptism. All right, I'm going to stop there and then open it up for some thoughts and questions. That you feel free to comment. Uh, if you have any comments to make, anything that was clear to you or not clear, feel free to bring it up. And of course, as usual, Praveen will also have his take on some of these aspects. Maybe Praveen, you can fill in some aspects uh, uh, which will help our members. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. There are a few thoughts I would like to bring to your notice, which we haven't uh, uh, covered till now in these uh, the three, three questions we have. I mean, the questions we have read, these are comments related to that. Uh, number one, just for information, I'm sharing it with you. Most of the Protestant churches don't call it sacrament. They call it ordinances. Okay. Many of them right. they call it. It is because of the history that Catholic Church carried. Uh, they, they taught uh, salvation is through the sacraments also, by the grace of Jesus through faith and also the sacraments of the church. That's what the Catholic Church taught. So when the Reformation took place, in order to get rid of that, they changed the language entirely from sacraments because it is carrying a message that through these uh, rituals, a person will be saved. So by, from this, we understand one thing that we are not being saved either by baptism or by Lord's Supper. 
that one thing we have to understand that is the reason protestant church changed the language ordinance this yeah, is commanded correct. by the lord so we follow it that is number one thing and number two thing is uh, the why these ordinances or sacraments are followed in the church this is not something new for us as pastor also mentioned in the old testament there were festivals and they were asked to perform those uh, celebrate those festivals in a particular manner only so like a passover uh, unleavened bread all these kind of things because uh, these uh, practices are always with a certain message for the first for the first people who receive this ordinance for the people who receive this message that is a message of hope for tomorrow like the uh, ch children of israel were in the last day uh, they in their on their last night in egypt they were asked to eat passover wearing sandals and uh, wearing certain kind of dressing uh, which are symbolic to say that i started my journey i'm leaving and i'm not going to come back to this place that is strengthening the faith in the, the children of israel because 10 plagues they have seen nothing happened so nine plagues they have seen nothing happened this 10 thing it's definitely going to happen that is the message that was the faith it was building in them and then it is looking it is continued always because god always asks them to remember what happened in egypt so that we may not they may not be unjust to the people they may not take other slaves they they may not make others as slaves and treat them badly so it has a message for uh, today also so it has a message of faith and hope it has a message for uh, our lifestyle also so these uh, that is that is most uh, most of these sacraments and ordinances are like that they carry such meanings so even as we take a partake in baptism of jesus christ sorry baptism and as well as lord supper these two ordinances are carrying certain messages the baptism carries the message that were passed said we participate in the baptism of jesus in other words we can so we identify ourselves in jesus that's what paul says i was crucified with christ buried with christ and rose again from dead with christ so he identified himself in jesus christ and through the taking the lord supper we remember what christ has done for us and we do it till jesus come it speaks about our hope that jesus is going to come back that is a message of hope and faith the hope that strengthens our faith and number two thing is uh, uh, it helps us to participate with jesus as we are taking part of his bread uh, and wine one particular thought we need to bring here is as we are talking about various perspectives about uh, lord supper we have seen about transubstantiation consubstantiation symbolic and memorial there is another thing that is called uh, trans elementation trans elementation is a very many uh, trinitarian theologians they they have taken it and there are some uh, data also even in our gci website regarding trans elementation it is simply like this understanding the purpose of uh, communion and participating see we are in the early church book of acts where after jesus ascended to heaven especially if you read from book of acts chapter 2 onwards where they were going house to house and they were breaking the bread that is basically communion they came together on a table that is communion actually for today for us uh, in our i mean uh, we uh, observe communion differently for us communion is just taking a small piece of bread and small cup of wine and we consider we are participating but in the early church it is basically a meal like our second sunday we meet uh, on love feast we have this is a meal where people come and share that's why in second corinthians paul says uh, some of you are becoming greedy and becoming uh, you're getting drunk by communion so that those things were happening so whatever the main thing i would like to tell there is uh, communion is about a meal, sharing a meal which is talking about a fellowship communion the meaning itself is communion communion the meaning communion itself is a uh, fellowship you know so the uh, the very purpose of uh, 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 this holy communion that we take is he coming into fellowship with our brethren and coming into fellowship with god so previously in one of my messages i shared about sacrifices 
why sacrifices are all about what the sacrifices are all about if you read from old testament the sacrifices or most of the sacrifices are with food most of the sacrifices there are no sacrifices without food people have to bring something offer something and they have to come together sit share and eat why these sacrifices are about all about food it is because food is a right place where people can have fellowship so when we come to, to take do sacrifice we offer food to god god is participating in the same meal with us we are having fellowship with him the same thing in the lord's supper we are having fellowship with god and we are having fellowship with our brethren the fellowship thing is very important uh, as we partake in lord's supper that is what uh, trans elementation uh, is about uh, i'm just giving you the main point of uh, uh, trans elementation i'm not explaining everything uh, technically so this uh, lord's supper the baptism these uh, these things are that these are symbolic as well as it is very important for us to understand that the message they carry every time we perform something it should uh, we should understand we should get connected to the message that they give and the purpose they give of course god commanded us that's why we do and especially when we take a, a baptism we all, we should have a sense and that we are identifying ourselves in jesus and participating in the life death burial and resurrection of jesus through baptism and through lord's supper we are coming into fellowship with god as well as with other brethren these things are very important for us to uh, understand as we discuss about uh, these stuff as we are moving forward i guess uh, it would be more interesting all right i think i think there are very good points made i think it uh, brings in some more thoughts into it any any thoughts that any of you have yes david go ahead yeah this is uh, my uh, it's my understanding so maybe uh, i am wrong so please correct me uh, <clears throat> basically the fall of adam was again connected with the communion uh, disconnection right uh, again uh, the food was the element again fruit or whatever mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the second adam which is jesus christ himself again is bringing back uh, with the communion again it's uh, the fellowship so as uh, brother pravin was sharing uh, <clears throat> that uh, there was always an element of food which is connected with uh, bringing people together in fellowship so is, is this my question is uh, the after the fall of first adam the second adam is connecting back to us it's is it the element of food which brings back the fellowship again because what uh, adam did was again <laughs> it was a fruit of course um, part of food if you will um, so i just wanted this is my own uh, you know analysis but just correct me if i'm wrong or theologically and all. okay well i'm not sure if i fully understood your question uh, but uh, you you know even though it is not explicitly mentioned about food as such but you can make that uh you can make that connection you know you could uh, you could uh it's not wrong to look at it from your perspective you know with regards to food but of course remember the communion is with the person the communion is between person it is not with food so, okay one of the elements i was just <laughs> media yeah. right uh, and jesus uses it as a symbol but communion, don't forget, is with the person, and it is. Right, and right. I think, like Praveen said, sometimes we, be, we give so much importance to the ritual that we yeah. forget what its purpose is. Its purpose is to connect with people, and with right. God. so we should not forget that, right? Maybe I don't know. Praveen has any thoughts on that? Uh, here it is not about food, basically. It is, but food is creating an opportunity for us. Right. Yeah. Food is the only place where people stand or uh, stand still or sit and eat. People <laughs> don't time, run yeah. and okay. eat. Okay, <laughs> okay. for simple. Right. So right. that's a place right. where we can sit together and can exchange our thoughts. Spend uh, some time. That is yeah. one of the things. But it is not about uh, any food 
separated us because Adam ate or Jesus brought food. So food, yeah. food united us. <laughs> That's <laughs> what, uh, I, I, I didn't confirm that anything. It was no, just no, my I appreciate, I appreciate uh, your observation. I right. appreciate your observation, but uh, basically it is creating an opportunity. Right. That's, okay. uh, that, that is what uh, uh, we need to realize. Okay. Right. And uh, one more thing we need to understand, Passover, just remember, Lord's Supper, see, every time Passover, Lord's, sorry, Lord's Supper is taken, we need to understand that we are being set free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, every time we come to the Lord's Supper, most of the Christians, we still think, God, I'm bound, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still in my sin, I got stuck here, you know, I mean, I'm still in bondage. Mm -hmm. This is for the people who, who were in that thing. The Passover brought them out from out of Egypt. Christ has brought us out, out of sin. So uh, Lord's Supper or communion is a message for all of us that we are not in that anymore. So when we come to communion, it is not the point of testing time for me to stand. I'm standing before God. Okay, let me think about what all sins I have committed in the last week. I need to confess so that I can part. It is not about that. Keep okay. all those things away because Christ has set us free from that. And we are not, as Israelites did not see Egyptians anymore. We are not going to be bound to our sins anymore. Forever we are set free. This is a time of our celebration, celebration of our freedom. So as we participate communion, into communion, uh, you know, unlike others, let us be reminded about our redemption in Jesus Christ. So can we rejoice when we participate in that communion? Is the, that is the very purpose. That's what we need to do. We have to rejoice always when we... The celebration. In yeah, <laughs> Thank you, Pramin. Thank you, Pastor. It was wonderful. Really. Thank you. I think it's basically the celebration of God's forgiveness, uh, His grace, His mercy on us, okay. and that we are set free. Absolutely. Amazing. Yes, Anand. I think uh, that's a good point. I think uh, both, like both, uh, both of you said, uh, Praveen also, uh, it is, it is uh, the Passover was almost like a future event. You're looking forward to redemption. But for us, the Lord's Supper is something that took a redemption has already taken place. So uh, it's a celebration of what has already been done for us. Yeah. Bertram, you have to unmute. Go ahead with your question. Can you hear me? Yes, Bertram, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we identify with Christ every week. Uh, we are baptized into him. He has set the example for us in his humanity, and we hope in the spiritual participate in the spiritual humanity. What my question is: Do uh, could you could you just uh, enlighten me about Christian traditions? About Christian traditions, uh, is it something that we should uh, bear in mind, be mindful of, since we are in Christ? Is uh, uh, is there anything is something that the Bible reveals uh, like Christian traditions to you know the, uh, uh, is a he thing or uh, uh, you know pleasing to God and something that we should follow? Can you name some Christian tradition that uh, you might that you know that you're talking about? Uh, giving is one. Giving. Say that again. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Giving. Giving is one fellowship. Is another fellowship. Okay. Uh, and, and, and also carrying the brethren. Okay. Caring for okay. the brethren. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Could you have Hello. Bertie, yes, Bertie B, your voice was cutting off, but I, I think I got what you were trying to say. You are trying to refer to practices like giving, fellowship, caring for brethren. You, uh, you are... And, and I, 
yeah uh, continue hello yeah and i'm not sure why your voice is getting cut but uh uh but yes these are uh, uh what do you say not tradition i don't know if i can call it christian traditions these are christian uh practices or this is a lifestyle you know a christian lifestyle when we are in christ we automatically learn to be giving and uh you know enjoy fellowship uh we are very mindful of those who are less fortunate so we care so that is part of the way we live uh it is not necessarily just a tradition that we try to do you know once in a way but this is a ongoing uh, a, a christian life that we adopt and we live does that help buddy yes it is the lifestyle yes okay can you hear me yes yes anybody else have any comments on that feel free can somebody add to it i don't think uh, whatever you listed out would be called as a uh, uh, traditions buddy they are uh, as pastor said one is that is that would be our lifestyle and if you consider in uh, imperative terminology those are the commandments of the lord and uh, we have to observe we have to give we are we are to come for celebrate we have to come for fellowship and uh, whatever we are talking about you know and if not that also we all want to be conformed to the image of god the very image of yes. god is a fellowship father son and the holy spirit he is a fellowship your fellow yeah, and we are believing in a relation yes. of god and we are more of, we are standing for relationship can we talk about relationship without going and meeting somebody else relationship can only exist when we go and meet somebody that is what the fellowship is all about we cannot simply say i love you and when somebody is suffering and we don't want to open our pockets to help others can we really call them can we really call it love the primary expression of love which we find in the bible in john is in john 3:16 for god so loved then how did he express express it by giving, by giving. giving is the primary expression of love so these are not to be considered as traditions these are to be considered as the characteristics of god and which we want to develop in ourselves and uh, since we are poured the love of god in our hearts that would be our lifestyle and if you take in a more uh, uh, commandments kind of language those are something that god commanded us so these are not traditions okay, okay. We have a few minutes left feel free to go ahead and make your comments sikinda you have any thoughts you have to unmute uh, sikinda is that uh, sac- taking sacraments is anything to do with uh, opening up of, of our minds to the truths or uh, uh, taking us uh, forward in faith in in old testament uh, they used to have the prophets they know they used to teach the people and warn the people also and this time in the new testament is it anything to do with the opening up of minds and exposing us, us to the uh, truths of the bible the word of god okay um the way i'll answer that question is remember the sacraments or the ordinance that we call it uh has a purpose it has a meaning it is symbolic of something so when you participate in it 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 automatically reminds you of what you are doing and why you are doing it so in that respect it opens your mind to further deepen your understanding of god's relationship with us and his continual interaction with us 
So yes, I think the ordinance are very helpful in that respect. It, it's a reminder of, you know, our vocation as disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That is why all the festivals in the Old Testament, when God commanded them to observe, he asked them to share the story of the festival to the children of Israel. They have to share the story with the children. And then they have to observe the uh, festival. So if you forget the story and observe the festival, that becomes what uh, Bertie is calling as tradition. So the story is very important. Story leads to great uh, message. And even the Lord's Supper, the, it's not just something, it's something we don't, we just simply disperse the bread and wine. We explain what Christ has done. And then only we offer the sacrament. So that if you observe one thing I would like to bring to your notice, uh, if you look at uh, various churches like Catholic Church, Anglican Church, Lutheran Church, Methodist, and uh, even uh, this one, Greek Orthodox Church, these churches, their worships are more liturgical. They are not, their, their learning is not based on the message that preach, uh, I mean, the priest gives. The learning will be primarily focused on the liturgy. And what is that liturgy? Liturgy is all about Eucharist, primarily, if you talk. Liturgy is all about this Lord's Supper. When the message that Lord's Supper carries, that's what they sing in the liturgy. If you get any time, if you got an opportunity, you listen to that liturgy. That's a very beautiful, rich explanation of the uh, Christian uh, beliefs and doctrine. So that all are followed with these sacraments or uh, ordinances that we are calling. So they always carry great truths and messages. Okay, well, time has a way of running away from us. <laughs> I notice it is already past 7.30. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Remember, if you should have any questions or any comments, uh, feel free to just send a, uh, you know, an SMS or a, or a WhatsApp message. Uh, we will always be happy to consider that. Thank so you. let's go ahead. Mrs. I, I guess Mrs. Noah wants to. Yeah, Mrs. Noah, you had a thought? Uh, you have to unmute. We can't hear you, Mrs. Noah. You have to unmute. Somebody can help you. Slight fever. Now, now you can. Now you can. <laughs> okay. So please pray for me. Uh, what was the specific issue? Nothing. Fever. 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 Just fever. Okay. And very. I mean, mild fever. But still. Back pain because of back pain, I have the fever. Okay. Okay, we will uh, we will uh, have a prayer for you. I and remember our uh, my previous landlord. Yes. Had uh, he has asthma the other day, we have to rush and take him to hospital. Oh my. Uh -huh. uh, we were concerned that it it can be COVID, but uh, thankfully it was not. Okay. It, because of asthma, he was not able to breathe. Yes. So they put him under ventilation for a ventilator for a while and sent him back. Right. Okay. Well, remember, Mrs. Noah and uh, your landlord. Anand, uh, would you mind uh, closing in prayer and just remembering these two people? Go Sam ahead. also. Yeah, Sam Poppins is hospitalized. If you can just remember him also. What happened, sir, to Sam? Sam Poppins uh, is suffering from very acute uh, stomach uh, abdominal pain. So they have not yet fully, uh, what do you call it, diagnosed it, but they are expecting it to be more constipation type of problem. So, uh, so just remember him in prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, the God, the Supreme God of the universe and the earth, we come before your throne this evening. We thank you a lot for this Bible study that you have facilitated us for us to understand about your truths, your ways, and helping us to realize how loving, and how kind, and how caring you are, O oh Lord, towards us. And thank you for reconcili reconciling us with you, Father, 
at this moment we remember Mrs. Nova who has back pain and fever. Ask your Lord that your hand be on her, that you please grant her the healing that she needs, that she'll be well. Please take care of her Lord, give your guardian angels to guide, to protect her and heal her. Father, we also remember Sam Hawkins, who's hospitalized to suffering from stomach pain and constipation. We ask you to please touch him and heal him. We also remember Praveen's landlord, our Lord, who's been suffering from asthma. Ask you, Lord, that you can touch him and heal him and take away this asthma from him and give him the normal breath to breathe without a problem. We remember these people specially, Lord, and we come to you for your healing because you are the one who created us and you know what we are made up of. So we look to you for healing from within, physically. Lord, we thank you again for all the participants. Please bless them. Open their hearts and minds to understand and bless us with your spirit that we may know more about you and your ways. We come at all this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.